All right, hey, what is up, everybody? I've got Peter Beatty on from Peter Beatty's Garage. Pretty awesome YouTube channel. I've, uh, I've checked out a few of the videos over the last uh, few months, and one of the things I really admired about Pete was uh, his transparency when it comes to his business life and his entrepreneurial journey. Uh, there's an article that he forwarded to me, um, which I'll link in the comments of the video uh, on Secret Entourage. There's a lot more background there you can check out. But I want to dive into uh, his passion for cars, and more importantly, um, his passion for entrepreneurship and the stuff that he's learned, some of the mistakes he's made, and uh, some of the stories he can tell along the way. So, what is up, Pete? Not much. <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm great, man. So, thanks for taking a, a little bit of time to chat with me on this. Um, no problem. I want to dive into some of this uh, car stuff. So, in one of your videos, you talked about um, your massive passion for cars, and um, it was this RX-7, this black RX-7, I think you said, was, was the thing that, like, pushed you into your love for cars. Was there a car that you had on your wall, like a poster when you were a kid that, you know, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's something that I got to have that I want to have. Was it a Lambo? Was it something else? Yeah, it was a, it was a purple Diablo. Um, and that was the poster that was on my wall. Uh, it was also like a white Countach. So, I mean, those cars are kind of. Did you I, have that Alpine white Countach with the black background and the Pirelli? Oh, I can't remember what that particular one was. Um, but um, yeah, it was definitely a white Countach and the purple Diablo. You can actually still, if you search purple Diablo poster online, that's the poster that I had right. uh, on my wall. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of weird because the, cause the Alpine white Countach is the same one that I really loved. And uh, I've never driven one. I've, you know, I've sat in one since and I've been told oh, yeah. never to drive it because it drives terribly. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe one day. It's kind of like, you know, never meeting your heroes. Um, yeah. Cool. So, so what was your first car? Well, my first car was a ninety, the ninety one or ninety two Ford Taurus. It was purple. Um, I got it uh, passed down to me from my great aunt. Um, so I kind of got lucky there. Um, I was, uh, you know, just got my license, and my great aunt she'd actually passed, and she one of her things that she left to my mom was her ninety one, ninety two Ford Taurus. And she said, hey, this is perfect timing. Here's your first car. Was it an SHO or just one of the little guys? No, nope, it wasn't an SHO. <laughs> I did own an SHO later, which I can tell you about if you want, but uh, it wasn't. Um, it was it was kind of ugly. Yeah. Um, put up hubcaps on it and tried to make it cool, but it, it really wasn't. So what was your first fast car? Like the, like the car you got into and you stepped in and you're like, man, this thing moves. Yeah, uh, the very first sports car that I had, and uh, I still miss it, was a 91 Eagle Talon TSI. Oh yeah, yep. All wheel drive turbo. Yeah, this one was actually the the front wheel drive turbo, so I didn't get the all wheel drive there, but it was you know pretty much the same thing. Awesome. And what yep. did you like about that, by the way? Um, I that was like my first turbo car. Um, I got to really experience you know the feeling when like uh you know the turbo kicks in and yeah, sets you kicking the pants. Yeah, uh, I fell in love with that, but unfortunately that car. I abused it and uh, didn't have the money to fix it, so it was very short-lived. Cool. And then you got into motorcycles. I mean, why the switch from cars to bikes? Talk to me about uh, that. Yeah, I can. Uh, well, I'd always been obsessed with bikes, um, um, dirt bikes and stuff. I'd actually ridden dirt bikes since I was like 11. Um, but my friends after high school started getting sport bikes, and um, you know, I just decided to to, to buy one and join everyone and. That's what got me into sport bikes. Yeah, for me, I you know I got into bikes when I was like 19, and it was simply because I couldn't afford a fast car. But oh. I realized, you know, like my first bike was a Katana 600, which was an oil and air cool slowpoke. Like it wasn't that fast. I think I got it down a quarter mile, like 13 and a half seconds was the best time. I mean, cars could do that now straight off the, the lot. But um, yeah, for me, it was like nothing will accelerate as quick as this, stop as quick as this, and get the gas mileage I can get out of it. Yeah, that's for less than a hundred grand in a car. Yeah, that's exactly. Now that you said that, it kind of reminds me of that time in my life, and that was one of the reasons why I had a motorcycle, was because you really couldn't beat the, you know, the the performance that you got for the money. Really. Do you still ride? Oh yeah, I, I still do. I get a ZX10R downstairs and um, some dirt bikes and four wheelers. Cool. Um, I saw I saw on your channel one of your most popular videos is how to. Uh, how to wheelie. Oh yeah, that's an old one. Yep. Yeah. It's got like almost a million views on it. 
Um, yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool because because it, because it, it brings me right back. You know, the whole you know clutching it up and you know pushing down, yeah. pull it up on the bars and all that. It's always a ton of fun. Do you guys have um, like um, riding and racing events in your area? Like, where do you live? You're in New England, right? Yeah, I'm in Southern Maine, um, pretty much almost on the New Hampshire border. So um, we have a drag strip. I mean, that's like an hour away, and that's pretty much the the only thing that we have as far as a track. Right. Uh, we do have a road course that just uh, finished being built, uh, Palmer Raceway. We'll be going to that in the couple, next couple weeks, actually. Can you tell everybody a story about um, something that happened on one of your motorcycle escapades? I mean, I know I've got tons of them, but uh -huh. I want to talk to you about your stuff today. Hmm. The motors, like the motors. <laughs> sorry. Um, well, when I had, when I first got into motorcycles, I was in my early twenties, so I was really kind of, I was really kind of an idiot. So we would ride around and do wheelies everywhere, and right. I always rode with a friend who was always a little bit more crazier than than everyone else and he would try to he would just do crazy things he would wheelie around cars and anyways you know people would just end up calling the cops on us and you know the cops would chase us down that was like kind of a weekly thing um so yeah i mean i don't think that was really i'm trying to think the cops were just called a lot uh, <laughs> yeah that's pretty much I, how i could sum that up uh you know we'd be wheeling down the highway and some people would be filming with their phones or some people would just call, instantly call the cops, and the cops would be waiting for us and stuff. Do you guys like have uh, street racing laws over there, where if you're 50 uh, over the limit, then they take away your car or bike? Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure on that, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I think it's criminal speeding. Yeah. 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 Because over here they put a law in a place where they take away your uh, car if you're doing 50 over, uh, and they actually crush quite a few cars. There's a bit of an outcry. I'm not sure what they did with that, but. Uh, yeah, there's not there's not much in the way of um, people that um, will let themselves get caught now. But yeah, it was it was a great fun fun time for me too. I mean, I stopped riding when I was thirty just because I had friends that were either getting hurt or dying or whatever, right? So it's yeah. just uh, you know just something that I lost interest in. I moved over to convertibles. Um, yeah. All right. So the story of the Lambo, everybody can find it online. Like I love the passion for the car. Now that you've got it, you've done work to it. I think you've slammed it. You've put on uh, catless pipes. What's the car like for you? Like, um, I love that when you go to places and you do these events and things and you see people, it's like, you know, there's a kid that's freaks out over the car and like, ah, and you take him out for a ride. Like, I love shit like that. Like, I like that you're able to connect with people and kind of, kind of humble yourself. Cause there's some people, I remember when I was a kid, one of the first, um, exotic cars that I saw, it was a Lamborghini. I was probably about 11 or 12 and it was a Countach. And yeah. the guy that got out of the car, he was just an asshole. Like, he wasn't kind to anybody. There was everybody kind of, you know, standing around looking at it. Like, what's that like for you going from the kid that had nothing to going to the kid that, you know, from outsider's view would say he's got everything now. He's got this guy out of Yeah. Um, well, well, I just kind of remember what it was like to always, to always wonder what it was, you know, what these people that owned, like, all these crazy cars, what they did, how they got there, and. And, you know, a lot of people aren't really, they aren't really excited about, you know, telling you the details. Um, like you said, some people are just assholes and, uh, and you know, just kind of ignore, ignore kids. And, um, and I just, I remember, I remember how hard that was for me wanting to even just see a Lamborghini. And if I did see one, you know, could I even get close to it to check it out? And so whenever I see a, a kid, a kid like that, that likes the car and wants to check it out, wants to sit in it, even go for a ride. You know, I, I, as long as they respect the car and everything like that, then I'm always down to, to give them that experience. Um, like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was parked at a restaurant, and uh, someone saw the car parked there, um, and his kid was a Lambo fan. He told his kid about the car. Anyways, the guy looked me up on Facebook somehow mm -hmm. and asked if I could give his kid a ride in the car. And to most people, I don't know, I wasn't freaked out by it or anything. I, you know, I, I just remember what it was like to want to see a Lambo. Mm. I was like, all right, this kid wants to see a Lambo, so I'll be met at a gas station and I gave him a ride. So that's so, the stuff. Really so like, he sent you like a random message on Facebook and yeah. you met him at a gas station ticket? That's awesome. Yeah. It, it sounds really sketchy, but um, the guy lived in the same town that I live in. Uh, I, you know, I looked at his Facebook to make sure that he was a real person. I was like, all right, we're going to be there with a bunch of friends anyways. You know, what's the worst that could happen? Was that the kid that you put in the video? The latest one, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I love doing stuff like that because, you know, I never got that chance. So that's just kind of my way of trying to give back in some way. Cool. All right. Well, I want to hop into some of the business stuff now, the entrepreneurial stuff, because I know there's there's so much car content on your website now. People can or your uh, channel, like people can just tune in and watch all that stuff. It's all there. I want to mm-hmm. dive into you, uh, your entrepreneurial journey, your business and some of the choices that you've made. Um, one of the things I noticed that was really interesting in the video that you talk about um, how you bought your Lambo um, was you made a decision rather than trading your uh, time, because there's a lot of people out there. I mean, like you can take a lawyer, for example, that could be making $500 an hour. He's only going to make $500 an hour. Uh, that That's that period of time that he trades for the 500 bucks. Whereas the decision that you made was I'm going to create these intangible products that are digital eBooks, whatever, and I'm going to put them out there and people can buy them when I'm on vacation, when I'm sleeping, when I'm driving, when I'm not at my desk, when I'm not working. But I think that's a key point. I mean, there's, you know, subscription business models, there's service-based business models. You know, you went from architecture, construction to this, this job, which is really, it's, it's just stuff pulled out of thin air. You know, you create content, you put it out there for people and they buy it. When did you actually realize, man, I've got something here that I can scale up and make business? Because you talk about, you know, the first little bit, you worked your ass off and there was no money coming in. I think you said your uh, girlfriend's mom had to buy groceries at one point. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. But Yeah, like talk about how, you know, that, that the like trigger point, that like pivot point, because a lot of entrepreneurs have this where they're like, you know, they're, they're just doing it and they're doing it and they're doing it. All of a sudden at some point they're like, man, I can scale this up. Like this is a real business. And if I throw some time and resources at, at growing this, like when did that happen for you? Yeah, um, so that was actually uh, in about, mid 2010 when that point happened uh at that point i had been running my web design business for about a year maybe a year and a half and like like you said i was kind of limited to um i I had discovered that i was limited to how many clients i could get right I i would have to get a new client every week to keep uh growing my income or keep my income going uh and then one day i was just kind of on the internet and um came across this this forum where like a bunch of internet marketers hang out and I noticed there was people on there selling um, like ebooks and video courses, um, you know, make ten thousand dollars by selling web design services to local businesses, you know, stuff like that. And um, that kind of really sucked me. And I was like, well, this is what I'm actually doing myself. I wonder if I could actually create a, an ebook or a video course showing what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wonder if anyone would buy it because I you know I was making you know decent money in the business. I was just kind of it was still limited because it was, you know, just me working. So I made an ebook teaching people what I was doing, and um, I, I actually launched. I uh, did my first product launch that uh, around yeah, mid 2010, and the the turning point was for me was when the first payments came in that day. I woke up, um, I launched the product. And instantly, I believe I made around like two twenty five hundred dollars in the first day. Right. Um, and sales, and I was like, "Wow, this is crazy! This is like two website clients for me. It would have taken me like two weeks or a month to to do this. I just did it in you know three hours or whatever it was at the time. Um, that was the turning point for me, um, and that ended up turning to to about like five thousand dollars in sales over the course of a couple weeks. And that's that was the turning point for me um, when I saw how quickly that I could take one thing that I created." put it out there and a bunch of people could buy it and it doesn't it doesn't require any extra input from me. Okay, so you made under under ten thousand dollars in sales. How much time did you have to trade for those sales? Like well, how much of your time creating the course did you have to spend? Well um I'm gonna be honest, I did procrastinate a lot to get that first product out. Mm-hmm. Um so I probably spent like several months, like probably six months writing this report and in reality it should have taken me a week. Yeah. I just was kind of afraid to get it out there, you know. I was like, I didn't, didn't think anyone was going to buy it. Yeah. So I just, you know, in my spare time from working with my clients, I would go, oh, work on this report in this video course, and someday I'll want, I'll release it. So I'd probably say about 10, 10 to 20 hours in actual work, right. stretching over the course of several months. All right. So, and in hindsight now, because a lot of uh, digital marketers will actually uh, pre-sell it product so before they even create it they're going to put it out on their list or their network and they're going to say 
um, you know, I know there's this problem in the world and I'm going to solve it with this. If you buy into it now, you're going to get it at whatever discount. And they basically test it to make sure people want it before they go and create it. Yeah. Is that the sort of stuff that you do now? Um, that's, yes. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of at the point now where, like, I know what my customers would will buy, but I've done that before several times where I will email my customers. I'll have an idea for a product product and I'll be like, well, I don't want to spend, you know, the next couple of weeks creating it um, unless I know what they want it. So I would actually email them and say, hey, I mean, I'm thinking about this is what I'm doing. This is the result I'm getting. I'm thinking about creating a product, teaching you how I'm doing it or creating, creating a software that will do it for you. Would you be interested in this? If I was to release it, just reply to this email, let me know. And if I get it, I used to tell them if I get at least 100 yes replies, I'll make the product. Yeah. And whenever I did that, that would be, I would get hundreds of replies back and that would be an instant, you know, okay, make this product. And, and you know, this is like a point, you know, for a lot of people where they're going to say, well, like, how do you find that audience? And is this an audience that you built off an email list? Is it a, is it a Facebook list? Is it a website? Is it a warrior forum? Like, where did you find these people? Well, this list was, my customer list um, was built by, honestly, just by growing that snowball for over five years now. Um, it started from zero with that first product launch I just told you about. Yeah. Um, repeating that process over and over again, um, and also injecting some Facebook ads here and there, some YouTube uh, marketing, um, just that kind of stuff over the course of five years now. Um, a lot of people get on my list because they buy my products. You know, one of my affiliates will actually send them to check out my product, mm -hmm. buy the product, they get on my list. So I'd say 90% of my customer list come, uh, come from affiliates. Yeah. Um, okay, so what bi business lesson have you learned the hard way and how can you help others avoid that mistake? Um, okay, so yeah, this is definitely um, the number one thing that I think kills a lot of young entrepreneurs and that's uh, trying too many different things. Like, it, it's crazy. I remember being in that stage, like when you're, you, you kind of know that you want to start a business but you don't really know what you want to do and you want to try everything. So I would say definitely you need to figure out what the one thing is and, and focus on that one thing. Stop jumping around from, you know, this idea to this idea. If some guy messages you and say, hey, I got this great idea for a business idea, um, you know, come and partner with me on it. Don't say yes, you know. You got to be kind of selfish and focus on your own thing. Um, I used to get people emailing me all the time wanting me to try out these different business ventures and I would instantly say yes. And, you know, yeah. yeah there's a lot of power in the word no, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's actually good to say no. Once once you have something that's working, don't go away from it. Don't stop doing it. Yeah. Um, there's no need to try anything else. I think a lot of entrepreneurs have ADD, so it's very easy for us to it's like, oh, look, there's a squirrel, and you go chase that shiny ball somewhere over there for a couple of weeks yep. or a few months thinking that it might pan out in something, and it never does. And, I mean, the right. thing that I noticed anyway, and, you know, tell me what your thoughts are, is you can't be a jack of all trades because then you end up being a master of nothing. Exactly. That's exactly, exactly true. Cool. Um, take me back to when you were a kid. What did you want to be when you were growing up? Um, well, when I was, <laughs> I wanted to be probably someone who raced motorcycles or race cars. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. That's what I really wanted to do. So I didn't fulfill that dream, unfortunately. But um, Why didn't you get into race car driving? Let's just touch on uh, I guess it was just kind of like, uh, I just thought it was unrealistic, I guess. I don't know. Um, did you ever pursue it, like price it out to see what it, you know, what it would take? No, I didn't. It's I didn't do anything with it. So fucking expensive, and I can say that because it's my channel, but it's really <laughs> expensive. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So, what's the most exciting uh, thing you have ever done? The most exciting thing. Um, with your clothes on. I don't want to hear about clothes on. Oh come on. <laughs> um. Well, most exciting thing. Well, um, I mean, honestly, in the past, the since I've had the Lambo, I've had a lot of those moments. Like, just last weekend, I raced the Diablo on the turnpike. Probably illegal, but that was one of the most exciting things I've ever had to do, I've, I've ever got the chance to do. Um, every time I can go out and cruise with other supercar owners, it's always like, wow, this is, like, the best day of my life. And then it happens again, and it's like, no, this is the best day. So, um, 
I would say whenever I can get out there and get together with like a, uh, other Lambo drivers, it's just really an awesome experience to be surrounded by other, you know, supercars. Um, it's just a feeling I've never ha I've got to experience before. I saw that you mentioned somewhere um, that buying and owning a supercar like the Lambo had opened up doors that you hadn't expected. And I've yep. heard this from a couple of other people before. I'm, you know, I'm from the camp where I can go and buy the exotic, but I refuse to because I use the money for other things. I, I don't know, it's because I'm 40, you know, my 40s now and I'm stupid or smarter. I don't know, whatever smarter. it is. But what doors have opened for you? Because, you know, I've heard a couple of people say this now, so fill me in. Oh, man, I'd love to tell you about this because um, a lot of people, um, they ask me, like, well, why, why would you go up there and spend – a hundred grand on on a ten year old exotic. Like, why would you do that? Um, wouldn't the money be better spent elsewhere? And uh, that would be the case. You know, that would be a stupid move if I wasn't actually, you know, do if I just kept the car in the garage and you know just kind of kept to myself. I think that would be kind of ridiculous to own the car. But um, I actually take the car out a lot. You know, I drive it and. It's always opened up. It's opened up so many doors because people are always asking questions. They want to know more about what you do, and it, you know, I always get the question, "What do you do for work? What do you do for a living?" And I can't count how many people have actually either found me from YouTube or face to face, and have somehow turned into you know a client of mine by buying you know buying something. You know, right. um, so that's one way that it's helped. Um, and also, I mean, you can't put a price on the people that you meet. Um, it's always good to have, you know, the more connections you have, I think, the, the better in anything. I've met so many g cool people that I never would have met otherwise. Um, you know, uh, other Lambo owners, other people who are just into cars. Um, it's just enriched my life in so many different ways. I mean, it's not just a car to me. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, those are a few different ways. And also, the, I've turned it into an income stream. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I put the videos on YouTube. It's not making millions of dollars, but it's, it's earning a decent income mm -hmm. uh, from that. Um, what's your biggest business regret, and what did you learn from it? Um, let's see. Okay, yeah. Uh, my biggest business regret was um, trying something out that I, that I wanted to try out just because everyone else said it was working for them. Um, so I had doing I had been doing the digital product thing for a while, and a bunch of my friends had in that business had stopped doing it, and uh, was trying something else. They were trying to start up software as a service businesses, mm -hmm. and I was like, all right, this seems really cool. I'm gonna you know I'm gonna put all my time into this software as a service business. I'm gonna you know dump a bunch of time and money into it to build this cool software app, and. Uh, I really didn't know anything about the business or anything and ended up losing a bunch of money uh, and it didn't work out. So from the, the lesson I learned from that was, you know, don't try to do something else just because everyone else says it's what you should be doing. Basically just do what's been working for you. Yeah. So have there been more failures than there have been successes for you in your business journey? Um, well, I would say there have been definitely more big successes than big failures. But, I mean, there's always, like, those mini failures on a daily basis, like, you know, you upset a customer, you get, you know, you can't find, you find a bug in, in, in a software that you created and you got to fix it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's definitely been more big successes than big failures. That's good. There. That's good. Yeah. Give me an example of something that scared the crap out of you immensely in business that you eventually moved on through. Um, okay, yeah. Um, a couple times um, I had... We, I had uh, created a product that I thought people were going to love and you know, put a bunch of time into creating it and then uh, launched it and like got probably a quarter of the sales that you know, I expected and I was kind of counting on that money to come in, you know, and uh, so that was a very scary time uh, for me. It happened a couple times and um, yeah, that was very scary because it was like you know, we're used to making this this set amount of income and then you create something and that you think people want turns out they don't actually want it and uh you know after that i would have like i would have like i had a couple nightmares like oh my customer was disappearing and <laughs> I no way to make you know make an income like i've had several nightmares about that waking up one day and my customer list is gone yeah yeah so that's 
that that was pretty scary. Like uh, the, thinking to myself, well, maybe they're not interested in your products anymore. Maybe. Do you think it was a timing issue, or, or just there's a total disinterest on whatever it was that you were trying to sell? Uh, it was totally me being selfish and and thinking that I knew what people wanted, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be something that they didn't want. Um, yeah. It was one of those. Yeah, it was one of those times where you're like, oh, they want this, and then you front, turns out, no, they don't. Yeah. Didn't ask them for their feedback, basically. The the three best questions that I um, learned from a good friend of mine about how to how to ask your audience, um, you know, for what they want, so you can build products and services to sell to them, is um, what do you like about you know, what we do, if this is a company, you know, for like my company is basically, so what do you like about what we do? What don't you like about what we do? And what do you wish that we were doing that we're not doing right now? And basically the third question gives you a lot of insight onto yeah. trading stuff that, you know, you should really be selling to them. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up right there. I mean, yeah. Um, so if you could do it all over again, like just to start from 10 years old, what would you do differently? Well, I would, um, I would honestly get I would get right into making software uh, and information products right away. I wouldn't waste any time. I would have, you know, I'd get I'd get right to it. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's what I would do. I mean, I would I would come up with uh, an idea for I would find an audience first. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people do things backwards. They say they try to come up with a business idea or a product idea before before they even know who's going to buy it. Mm -hmm. So. The first thing that I would do is I would find an audience of people online who are interested in a specific topic, could be training their dog or whatever, let's just say. Mm -hmm. And I would find these group of people. I would have to I would have they would have to be people who have bought similar products that I'm looking to create. They would have to be proven buyers. I find out what their biggest problem is that's not being uh, fixed or basically, and I would make a product to, to solve that problem. Yeah. Do you think there's still room for digital product growth out there? Oh yeah, definitely. I don't see, I don't see why it would be slowing down. I mean, the, I'm in the internet marketing niche, right? And supposedly that's a really saturated niche and tough niche to get into, but you know what? It grows every day. There's always new people coming online every single day, trying to figure out how to, do what I did, you know, five years ago. Yeah. Start, quit your job, and start an online business. There's always new people coming online wanting to do that. It's never going to stop. Yeah. So, there's always new people coming every day, I, and there's always new people. Uh, there's always new products coming out every single day. I don't think that there's really going to be. I don't think it's going to be saturated anytime soon. And then that's the internet marketing niche. There's so many marketers in the internet marketing niche. You go to a small niche like. Uh, use dog training again or forex or or make money with real estate or whatever mm -hmm. those niches you know they probably don't have as many uh internet marketers in them so i mean there's there's opportunities out there people think that things are saturated but you get out there and it's like the more competitive competition that's out there that actually is a good thing um especially with digital products because you can promote each other's stuff yeah yeah um Describe the most unpleasant job you've ever had to do. Um, the most unpleasant job, well, number one would definitely be working in construction. Uh, although I learned a lot from working in the construction field, I learned a lot about work ethics and basically not being a little bitch <laughs> and getting work done. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot about work ethic in that field so I don't regret working in that field but it did suck having to work in the rain you know 10 hours a day packing a lunch eating a cold ham salad sandwich um, you know waking up at 4 in the morning when it snows out because you have to go shovel sidewalks that was definitely one of the worst jobs that I had I'll give you another one if you want I yeah. used to have to I used to work at a car wash um, and you know those uh, tunnel car washers that the that basically drag your car through. Mm -hmm. um, well, most people don't realize that below that, the dirt from the cars has to go somewhere, and it goes into like this little trench that runs the entire length of the car wash. And so, I would have to be the guy that would have to go in that trench and shovel out all the dirt that wow. basically washed off all the cars. And let me tell you, that that stuff stinks. 
<laughs> I kind of did a similar job when I was in uh, high school because I took, you know, because I thought I wanted to be an auto mechanic because I love cars and I worked at a co-op job at a, uh, a shop. And one of the jobs that the owner had me do once was there's a trench at the end um, of the uh, base, you know, because you basically take this big, long squeegee and you push all the crap that falls out. So brake dust, rust, oil, grease, whatever. And it collects in that, in that trough, kind of like what you're talking about. Yeah, and I literally had to take like a spade and shovel this slime out. It was it was yep. probably like the worst thing I've ever had to do. It, was, it smells disgusting too. Yeah, it kind of smells like like sewage, kind of probably. Yeah, it's brutal. But uh, you know, I've mentioned this before. I think everybody should do a shit job at least once in their life because it gives them perspective on you know work and work ethic too. Yeah, definitely. I think it's necessary. Um, what would you consider a defining moment in your entrepreneurial life? Um, define like a turning point, kinda. Yeah, something where it's like, man, this is like a major milestone. Um, milestone. Well, um, it would definitely be this past week. I think was one of the big milestones. Um, having our first six-figure launch of a of a digital product. Um, I'd seen a bunch of my marketing friends do it over and over again, and even hit seven figures, but um. For some reason, I just had never been able to to break that six figure barrier. So um, I uh, got some advice from a friend who had done it numerous times. Learned uh, learned what he basically uh, learned from him basically how he did it. Mm -hmm. um, even got his help uh, with some stuff and was able to crack that goal uh, last week. Awesome, cool. So um, I get I get a lot of questions from people on my page, and I'm sure you've seen a few as well. One of the most common things that I get that, that pops up that I want to get your feedback on is, you know, people are always like, how do I get started? What do you do for the initial first step? Like they've got this idea, they think they have a business, but they have no clients whatsoever. And they have this fear, like something that's holding them back from doing what they think they want to do. What sort of advice would you give people like that? Um, and that, that's something that happens to a lot of people because you know, they just get paralyzed by over analysis. Basically, they just they just are in constant research mode, constant you know book reading mode, constant business planning mode, constant business card printing mode. Mm -hmm. And a lot of young entrepreneurs always they do message me on Facebook. They find me from YouTube. They they you know they message me, and that's a lot of those. A lot of the questions are like that. Like, yeah. oh, I have I have this idea, but I'm afraid someone's going to steal this idea if, if I do. This. Right, or I have this idea, so I just print all these business cards for this business. I don't even know how it's going to pan out, but I just print all these business cards. Yeah, but I want to do this too. It's like oh, it's it just stop over analyzing, stop overthinking things. Like I said, find that audience. Start with the audience first. Figure out what they need and uh, build a product to fill that need, and stick with that. Don't jump around. You don't need to make a you know a 10 page business plan. You don't need to print out, you know, business cards. You don't need to get a logo designed. Get out there and actually just sell something first. Yeah. Because nothing, nothing happens until you, until you sell something. Yeah. And uh, so that's what you got to do. Get out there and make it happen. Stop be constantly planning and overanalyzing things. But yeah. I've, I've got a friend that, um, you know, on his business page, he, he, that it's got his first name, last name that it has uh, JFDI. I don't know if you know what that stands for. JFD, just get it, get it the fuck done. Just fucking do it. Okay. And you know, as simple and as maybe as crude as it might sound, it's it rings so true. I mean, if you just can't fucking do it, if you can't get up off your ass and pick up the phone, and like you know, they're like, well, how do I reach out to business owners? Hi. Yeah. This, exactly. This this thing over here works really well if you just pick it up and dial it. It really does, and and, and ask them for their business and. You know, yep. if they say no, then dial somebody else. And if they say no, then dial somebody else. And if you call a hundred people and they all say no, then maybe you don't have a business. Maybe, you know, maybe you got to look at something else because it's not packaged right or they're not buying it. You got to find an audience that's going to get it. You just have to do it. And if you can't do it, if you can't, you know, grow up and grow a pair to do it, then go grab a shovel and shovel shit out of a, a trough exactly. until, until you have it, right? Until you have it within yeah. you. Yeah, there's a, there's a guy, I don't know if you know him, um, He's a big internet marketer. His name is Frank Kern. I don't know if you've heard of him, but oh, yeah. one of his uh, famous quotes is, uh, thou shalt not be a little bitch. Yeah. It's basically that. Yeah. Stop being a little bitch. Stop thinking, oh, I'm afraid to do this. 
just get out there and do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last question for you. If uh, you had one book that you would encourage entrepreneurs to read, like what, like what tool and resource? Okay, let's do it like this. One book and one podcast if you listen to podcasts. Uh, one book would definitely be, uh, I really, really liked The Millionaire Fastlane by MJ DeMarco. I'm going to look that um, up because I haven't read that one. Yeah, um, it was just one of those books. I read it when I was running my web design business, uh, or I was kind of in the transitioning phase from going web design to digital products. And it was one of those things that really made up my mind. Like, you know, stop tying your income to the amount of hours you can work. You can't scale up a business that way. You can't build a business that can be sold later that way. And it, it was just an awesome book that really changed my mind. Um, I recommend it to a lot of people. Um, when they ask me that question, uh, um, so yeah, on the I, I've learned a lot from just reading in in, in like uh, in internet marketing forums. Honestly, I mean, and there's really not like one podcast that I listen to. Um, if I want to learn about a topic, I'll like go into the to the iTunes um, podcast directory mm -hmm. and I'll search for the keyword. Like if I want to learn about like Facebook ads, um, I would go into the podcast uh, iTunes podcast directory search for the keyword uh, Facebook ads and I would find a bunch of you know podcasts uh, on that topic um, same with YouTube I would go on YouTube and just search search for whatever it is that I need I don't think I don't I wouldn't say that I'm an information someone who uh, consumes information on a daily basis like I used to it's just more if I need to learn one specific thing I'll go up there and I'll find whatever I need to, to learn that cool all right so, yeah. so there you have it, folks uh, Peter I want to thank you immensely for taking some of your time to tell your story and uh you know hop on the skype call i you know i hope everybody gets a lot out of it um where can people find you aside from your youtube channel uh let's see i think if i'm on facebook um just search peter Beatty and uh one of my websites uh is video revolver.com cool all right so i'll throw all that in the uh, comments below man really appreciate you uh hopping on this thanks a lot man yeah thank you for having me